Thanks to Professor Hubbard and now Deborah Mason. She runs a blog called religionwriter.com. And she wrote, uh, in, in an interview, she said this recently, while I am in as interested as the next religion reporter in questions about the next great religion story and how to improve religion coverage, I do worry that these discussions are like so many concertos on the Titanic foredeck. She also went on to say that the mainstream media faces some very serious business problems to which it has not yet discovered any simple answers. So while we're honing our skills on the reporting side, the business side is deciding whether or not to throw us overboard. And then describe this situation a little bit regarding US newspapers, but if you want to need, know more, you should read a story that's in uh, the New Yorker, um, the March 20, 31st issue, it's called Out of Print, The Death and Life of American Newspapers. And, um, it describes kind of the palpable doom, as uh, they say in there, that, that newsroom managers are feeling right now. Uh, as U.S. newspaper investments have lost more than 40% of their value uh, in the last three years, and U.S. papers have cut a quarter of newspaper jobs uh, in the last decade. Uh, wrong way. There we go. That's just a quick, uh, shows you readership decline that's going on. Uh, as projected by Philip Meyer, who says that the last issue of the last newspaper is going to be printed in 2043. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and he might be optimistic, actually. <laughs> um, so in addition to this drop in readers, Craigslist and other competitors are sucking the advertising lifeblood out of uh, print newspapers. As, actually, this is also occurring with uh, broadcast media as well. And efforts to earn substantial dollars online have not yet materialized. Part of newspapers' problem is that we have increasing competition for our time and attention. And by, uh, by the way, these same problems, as I just indicated, exist for, for broadcast media. So uh, consider the gadgets in the media that vied for our attention in 1975, uh, all these ways of, of getting information into our homes, ways of displaying it, uh, ways of storing it and, and carrying it with us, and uh, then today. Now, the trends that I've mentioned perhaps sound hopeless, uh, but I see opportunities, actually. And it's in these opportunities that I, uh, we need to look into developing skills. Um, as people are disengaging from traditional journalism, print and broadcast, they are engaging with other uh, media types, as this indicates, through the internet. So uh, as you're familiar, whether it's MySpace uh, or Facebook, or uh, Ben mentioned BeliefNet, this happens to be their community, their social networking uh, community. People are creating new networks, new relationships, new ways of communicating. And as people become less, um, less engaged in civic life, uh, as Roger Putnam has argued in Bowling Alone, they hunger for interaction, and that's what you're seeing in some of these sites. Now with these shifts, the roles of journalists are shifting. And this is true of all journalists, uh, not just religion reporters. And so, um, as citizen journalism guru Steve Yelvington describes it, the gatekeeper uh, is now the town crier and, uh, and becomes a convener rather than um, uh, the sense of just pushing the news onto the reader and the reader as a passive participant. So because of this, the skills that all journalists need to know are different. And Yellington says that those skills uh, include community building, conversational writing, guerrilla marketing and promotion, uh, presentation and group interactivity skills, 
uh, not necessarily technology, which sometimes we get obsessed with, but that, will, that constantly changes and it's hard to keep up with that. So I've taken a long way to get to the meat of what I'm really uh, supposed to talk about, but like any good religion story, I felt that context was important here. Um, so what does this have to do with religion writing and how it's presented in the mainstream news? It means that the core of how we define news, the nature of news, is changing. And that in the case of religion reporting, that's a good thing because as Ben indicated, we've been caught in decades of uh, conflict framing for religion news <clears throat> and re reporting the culture wars as literal wars. Uh, where the nuance, the soul of faith and values in the lives of real people has been, in many cases, lost. Perhaps that's why in the largest newspaper study it comprised 37,000 readers. It was an in-depth content analysis of about 100 newspapers. Uh, it was funded with about 10 million bucks from the Knight Foundation. And what they found is that religion came in almost dead last in, in, among uh, 23 different topics of news, religion in terms of reader satisfaction. So, if after all of this dismal news, um, you, you still have a passion to write about faith and values, where do you go and what do you need, need to do? Well, first of all, um, you have to start with yourself and you have, to, um, you have to know your own values and your own beliefs and you have to know uh, where you're coming from in terms of um, your attitudes towards religion because you, you will be asked and you need to know how you're going to respond and how you're going to answer that uh, question. You can't assume things um, and it's true what they say about that. Uh, it, it's especially dangerous in religion and just because you grew up in a faith tradition and understand the nature of grace that doesn't mean that you understand that complex theological uh, concept uh, in all faiths. And in this country, you know, Ben mentioned uh, Baptists, the number of Baptists, and I think he said 40 or 50. I think actually in Gordon Mountain's academy, uh, uh, Encyclopedia of Religion, I think it's actually in the 60s, 63 was, was the last number I had. And so it's impossible. It's impossible to be an expert in every aspect of religion. So remember your humility and um, remember that you're never an expert and, and never be afraid to ask. Uh, you also need to know, in addition to knowing your own values, your own sense of ethics, you need to know your own biases and you need to understand where your religious biases are. You must approach the story not as though you're trying to prove a faith true or untrue. That's not what you're trying to do. You must have a respectful attitude when it comes to the validity of someone else's faith. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't ask hard questions about impropriety or abuses, quite the contrary. But you need to separate the actions of individuals from the principles of a faith. And I think in the coverage of Islam, uh, we've failed to do this the most. But we've also failed in our coverage, for instance, of evangelicals uh, for this. So one of the ways that I think is helpful to help us, help us deal with some of these problems that that religion presents uh, are, are to talk about fault lines uh, and faith faith as a fault line. That's not grammatical, is it? Faith as a fault line, that's a terrible thing. <laughs> At any rate, um, and I'm here I'm referring to the late Robert Maynard's use of the notion of fault lines as helpful. Um, and Robert Maynard um, was, the, uh, was at the Oakland paper and so this notion of earthquakes was very salient for him. Uh, and, and for um, Robert Maynard, and now it's namesake the Maynard Institute, um, he believed that the fault lines of race, class, gender, generation, and geography are the most enduring forces shaping lives, experiences, and social tensions in this country. And I think clearly, he didn't include religion, but I think clearly religion is one of those forces as well. And so although Maynard didn't include it in his framing, I, I think it, it works and uh, how they talk about fault lines is, is effective. So in much of today's media, the coverage breaks the country into black and white, north and south, male and female, into evangelical or mainline, Mormon or Muslim, atheist or religious fanatic. And this fails to capture this complexity in American life and, and including the spiritual life 
that journalists need to portray. So the Maynard Institute fault lines framework can, can be used as a quick checklist or a brainstorming tool that journalists uh, use to analyze and plan the content of their coverage based on the character of the community that they serve. And so, um, so they've come up with a series of questions that journalists can use when uh, they're getting ready to report these kinds of stories. And it also allows them to be anticipatory rather than reactionary in their reporting. And so their questions include, you know, the questions include what is the story about, uh, which fault lines are at work in these complex issues, which fault lines are dominant, uh, how do the other fault lines factor in, whose voices are telling the story, who has been left out, and where are your fault lines? This again gets back to your biases. How does that impact your work? So transitioning now into another quality that you need to have when engaging in religion coverage, and that's um, the rhino. I think I was just uh, on spring break and we went to a zoo and so, uh, I don't know, animal imagery for some reason was in my head, but um, you know, rhinos are tough and hard on the outside. And so no other topic really gets criticized or critiqued as much uh, as religion news. I mean, no, really, it is true, no other topic. There aren't other publications or blogs or uh, people who, whose livelihoods actually depend on day-to-day -day critique of uh, religion. And so you do have to have a, a tough skin and you do have to understand that it's a hazard of the beat and it comes with the territory. But never stop listening. Few things stir passions as much as faith and no topic is as complex and sometimes the critiques are right. So another quality to engender is the idea of being the perfect stranger. And actually, uh, there's a book by that name, Be a Perfect Stranger. And actually, Ben has written a book uh, for teachers for classroom use that includes a good bit of etiquette. But um, it, it's, etiquette is extremely important in religion, and particularly if you are a woman. It's an awkward feeling when you extend your hand to shake, uh, to, to shake a man's hand, for instance, if you're a woman, and it's not met in return uh, for reasons of modesty or other appearance of impropriety. So um, you need to be aware of, of etiquette, and uh, you need to know beforehand um, you know, where, what houses of worship you remove your shoes, or if there is gender segregation in terms of the seating of a house of worship. And by all means, don't invite somebody who's fasting out to lunch during Ramadan or Lent or any other of the various uh, faiths that have uh, particular times of fasting. You know, these are common and decent courtesies, and they go a long way towards showing somebody that you respect their beliefs and, uh, and that you don't seek to offend. Uh, so I highly recommend this book, uh, Be a Perfect Stranger, and, and um, it's, it's really um, very practical and, and useful. I also want to just talk about some of the tools that are out there because, as Ben indicated, uh, religion coverage has improved significantly. And um, I, I like to think, but of course I've been involved in some of the creation of these tools, that in part is because there has been so much in terms of development of, of tools for journalists to use. Most of this was thanks to a lot of grant funding that was available between 1999 and 2006. And a lot of that funding has ended now but it was really instrumental. And so um, this is a list of some of those uh, places and I'm gonna show, show some of those just uh, briefly here. So Ben mentioned Religion Link and this is, this is free and it can come to you electronically in your inbox and it'll take you a link to this site which is religionlink.org although Ben mentioned religionlink.com which we do own and it does point to this site. So either of those addresses work. Um, and this shows you, this was from uh, today's page, in fact, uh, but we do change it every week. And what we do is we, we um, provide ideas for stories and then we try to provide sources and links to um, groups that are experts in that. Uh, we, for instance, we do have a number of resources and source guides on um, Islam. Uh, and we recently did a webinar, we're, what we're starting to do now are webinars, which are also free, usually about an hour and 15 minutes, 
and what we're doing is pairing those webinars with the creation of resources such as religion. And so we recently had a webinar on covering Islam 101, and of course you cannot cover that topic in an hour and 15 minutes if that's ludicrous. So what we did is use it as an opportunity to point uh, people to more uh, substantive resources and places where they can get more information uh, online. And, and Religion Life is an enormously um, valuable and, um, and uh, well-regarded resource for journalists. Of course, I'm biased because I, <laughs> I run the organization that publishes it. Uh, Religion Source is a database of about 5,000 scholars. I'm certain uh, Dr. Hubbard is in it. Uh, it's, a, it's a database that's put out by the American Academy of Religion. You do have to register. You do have to be a journalist. They do allow student, students to register, however. And you can search by topic. You can search regionally. There are lots of different ways that you can search. And so um, Religion Source has become a really important tool for journalists trying to find scholars. And these are scholars of, of religion, so they're not advocacy people. And so it tries to... Uh, raise the level of intelligence and get away from this, um, you know, two-sided sorts of ways of, of reporting religion. The Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life is a Washington-based organization that works to create, uh, really they're trying to call themselves a fact tank, F-A-C-T, uh, that's, that's what they're trying to become, and they help sponsor and fund and participate in large-scale studies of religion. So they recently, if you saw reports in February, they released a study uh, among the largest studies of religion, uh, 35,000 individuals, and uh, it's called the uh, U.S. Religious Landscape Survey, and, and um, it's just a huge asset to people who are writing about religion to have the numbers that you need to tell you what, um, you know, what, what a group's size is and where they're regionally strongest and, and those sorts of things. Uh, Religion News Writers also has a style book and it's online, it's free. We do have print versions of it, but um, anybody who's a journalist knows that you generally try to follow a style so that there's consistency in how you refer to things. And for journalists, it's always been difficult in terms of religion because the Associated Press Style Book, which is the largest style manual in use, has had very little when it comes to religion. And so, uh, again, with some grant funding, we created this free style book. It's not an encyclopedia. It's not a dictionary. But it does focus on issues of style and how you, whether you capitalize something or whether Quran is spelled with a K or a Q those sorts of things, and um, so it's become very useful for journalists. There also is a primer online, a, a guide to covering religion. Again, it is free, but we do have print copies as well, and it does cover the basics, and it covers ethical issues, it covers um, you know, some of the places where you can get numbers related to religion, such as PewForm that I just mentioned. It has some very uh, you know, basic information about major faiths, and these kinds of things. And so, um, again, this is an incredible tool, and we particularly, uh, we get requests from a lot of schools and universities to get copies of these so that uh, professors can, can um, distribute them. Uh, finally, if you're passionate about covering religion and hope to spend the rest of your life doing that, have a backup plan. <laughs> Um, you should know, as Ben mentioned, that there are only about 300, 400 religion reporters. Only about half of those people write about religion full time. A few of those positions are filled externally anymore. Most of them are filled from the inside because of the number of layoffs that have occurred. Uh, if you are fortunate enough to be hired by a newspaper, you will almost certainly be hired as a generalist or into some other beat. Um, and so the religion beat after growing, uh, it's been indicated in the 1980s and 1990s, is stagnant and, uh, and designated religion pages are shrinking. Uh, I, I estimate that we probably maybe have 10 years or so. Uh, that's not a very scientific estimate, it's kind of a gut level based on what's happening in the industry, but I would say within 10 years uh, these uh, religion pages, religion sections, 
will be will be gone. Um, not everybody thinks that's a bad idea. By the way, they've been somewhat controversial and, and criticized for not uh, having enough hard news and so on. But nonetheless, they were a, a visible presence for religion in a lot of places across the country, and particularly in the South, where the Dallas Morning News, for instance, used to have a, a you know six to eight page uh, section on religion. So think creatively about how you do religion news and how it intersects with other beats, but also think outside traditional media uh, if it's your true passion. Uh, certainly, uh, religious media are flourishing, and for many of you, if you ap approach the topic from a particular faith background, then that's probably the way to go, working for a denominational press or working for one of the independent religious publications that are out there or online publications. But every one of you can you know, write about religion today if you really want to do that. And that's what blogs and this participatory journalism and media are all about. So I'm going to close with the story of Rocco Palmo. And Rocco is, he's a kid really, he's not very much older than you guys, he's in his 20s from Philadelphia. And this indicates some of the things that he writes about and some of the topics. He's a, uh, a, serious, uh, a serious journalist, uh, I mean a serious Catholic. And I guarantee you that as the, uh, in the next couple weeks with Pope uh, uh, Benedict XVI's visit to the United States, that, this is, that his blog is going to be checked numerous times a day by you know, most mainstream media religious, uh, religion reporters and of Catholic insiders and religious media. And they're going to be checking and seeing what Rocco's got on his blog called Whispers in the Logia. And uh, Rocco's blog, um, you know, Ro Rocco, as I indicated, he, he's a graduate from Penn, not in journalism, but his dad was a journalist at the Philadelphia Daily News. So he had this passion for journalism, he had this passion for his Catholic faith, the priesthood was not for him, and so, so Whispers was born. And he's done something that very few traditional journalists have done. He's been able to break stories and inside goings on from one of the most secretive and difficult institutions to cover, the Vatican. Uh, and so Rocco gets tips from inside the Vatican, from U.S. clergy, from laymen and women, uh, you know, and he writes in a way that's casual, that's entertaining. He adheres to journalistic values. Uh, for instance, he requires at least three sources to verify something before he puts it up in his blog. So he's not, you know, he's not, um, you know, a Matt Drudge who kind of puts up rumors before they're really substantiated. And as you know, this happens to be again uh, a recent post from today. And uh, you know he's talking about an appointment uh, of a new bishop, and he says, you know, you know, as as these pages first reported last week, and anybody who covers religion regularly will tell you that finding out who a new bishop is has is, it's almost been impossible in the past. It's extraordinarily difficult. You can narrow it down to a small number of people, but those secrets are very closely held. And here is this. 20-something kid in Philadelphia working out of, you know, at one point he was working out of his parents' home and so on, and, and he is changing uh, what the world knows about the Roman Catholic Church. And I, I just think it's, it's fascinating. Now, one caution, uh, Rocco will be the first to tell you that blogging is not a way to get rich. And so every so often, you know, well, in fact, he has a spot where he asks for donations. And sometimes he'll say, look, you know, I'm really strapped. I really need some donations to keep this blog going. Uh, he, he, he uh, you know, it's, it's not a way to get rich. But yet here you have one individual uh, working on a shoestring and, as I said, in, you know, affecting and influencing the coverage of the Catholic Church today. So remember this, in the world we live in, uh, religion can and will be found in many places, but not traditionally where it used to be found. Instead of bemoaning or being fearful of this, let's embrace it and use it as an opportunity to enlighten coverage of religion and in the process, the world. Thank you.